I sometimes feel as if about 90% of my job is interrupting good conversations. So I feel bad about it. So I, I've, I've, yeah, the other, the other part of my job is apologizing for the, uh, uh, what, uh, everything else that I do. I've often thought it'd be, you know, in terms of efficiency, it would just be easiest if I just had an I'm sorry sticker on my door. Uh, and uh, then we could just get on with it from, uh, from, from there. Um, so, uh, truth in advertising, uh, you know, Ron and Jill are both well known in the economics of, of higher education. There's no reason on the face of this earth for anybody to know anything about my uh, role as an economist in higher education. So, I'm, uh, I don't know uh, uh, anything terribly great about this industry other than I've lived in it for a, uh, uh, for a long time. So I, uh, one more time, apologize in advance for my inability to say um, uh, anything important. But Jill's sitting right here. So we're in good hands when you ask a question. And I will just pass it to Jill. And she can answer it. So um, let me start with, uh, uh, with just an important disclaimer to the uh, rest of my comments, which are going to be fundamentally dismal. Uh, and, but they belie my real sense of optimism about the, uh, about the industry. And one of the reasons I'm optimistic about the industry is, you know, if you had, uh, uh, had asked me uh, at the start of a recession that this is going to be a really nightmarish recession in terms of family income and housing prices, uh, and it's going to last for at least four years, uh, I would have said, wow, this is going to be a really, really tough time for, uh, for our industry, that we're going to see um, uh, uh, pretty dramatic reductions in the number of, uh, of students that are applying to our schools, that we're going to have to really get serious about budget cuts in a variety of ways. And none of that happened. None of that happened. We all cut a little bit. But um, uh, the notion of foundational change in the economics of our, uh, of our um, uh, colleges is just not real. It uh, didn't really ever uh, materialize. That's, a, that's an enormous sign of strength. Uh, you know, admittedly, we're a tiny fraction of things. But it's an enormous sign of strength for the, for the sector. There's something that we're doing that, at least for this small fraction of the population, is highly valued by that group and robustly valued by, uh, uh, by, uh, by those people as well. And that's, a, you know, that's an encouraging thing. So um, you know, my optimism is at 80% of maximum. Um, so, um, uh, so those of you that are nearly as old as I am will, uh, may remember uh, Dr. Strangelove. Uh, and uh, the subtitle of uh, Dr. Strangelove was, or how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. So we'll see whether this works. And you're probably going to have to put up with a modest uh, advertisement for 15 seconds here. Uh, but Dr. Strangelove is the uh, story uh, of the US and Soviet arms race. Uh, and it's told in a glorious way by um, Stanley Kubrick in this uh, amazing movie. I'm just going to show you a relatively modest scene from this, if this works. And if it doesn't, we'll live without it. So, um, uh, so I'll tell you the story of Dr. Strangelove <laughs> uh, under these conditions. Uh, so uh, um, there's a rogue um, uh, military personnel who uh, 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 decides that he's going to take it upon himself to, uh, to fly a plane with a nuclear weapon into Soviet space and deliver the, uh, the bomb. Uh, and uh, it turns out that the Soviets have created a fail-safe device uh, so that if there's a plane that flies into their airspace then, uh, and is detected, then the world will destruct. Uh, and uh, so it's a doomsday device 
that, uh, that they've created. And uh, so there's this scramble to figure out how it is that uh, the US and the Soviets collectively can possibly stop this person from delivering the bomb uh, to uh, the Soviet Union, which is going to not just deliver a bomb to the Soviet Union, but trigger a, a broader destruction of the, uh, of the world. And the, uh, uh, and the advisor around this is Dr. Strangelove, uh, who uh, is asked, uh, uh, in the scene I was going to show you, uh, is asked, you know, what sort of crazy person would actually build this sort of thing? Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, answer that's given to him is, well, we were stuck in an arms race. Uh, and we had to compete in this arms race. And the only way to get out of this arms race was to develop a credible commitment out of this thing. And the credible commitment was the doomsday device. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, uh, they're asked, uh, you know, well, the whole point of a doomsday device is to make it well known. Because if you're trying to develop a credible commitment to mutual destruction, you got to let the other side know that you've, that you've got this thing. And it turns out they were waiting for a special occasion to let people know. So it's a, uh, 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 the timing was just off by, uh, uh, by a little bit and all of this. And, uh, uh, and that's a, uh, so that's the story. Well, it's a metaphor. And this, the, the Dr. Strangelove arms race metaphor is a metaphor for our industry in, uh, in a variety of ways. And so, we will now go back to technology that I'm probably better off at doing. So here's, here's um, so if Dr. Strangelove is sort of the first part of what I'd like to sort of get across as a metaphor, the second part comes from this conversation which allegedly happened, if you, if you look at this, uh, it's a relatively well-known conversation, although it's attributed to F. Scott Fitzgerald as the other side of this, and apparently that was not the case. And so maybe Mary Collum, who was an a Irish author. But you know, Ernest Hemingway is saying, you know, I'm getting to know the rich, and Mary Collum saying, well, I think you'll find the only difference between the rich and other people is that the rich have more money. Uh, and uh, that brings me to then the uh, title of the talk, which is How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Merit Awards, you know, the take on uh, Dr. Strangelove, and then the tuition-driven school's dilemma. So, uh, 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 so I, um, the, uh, the, what I'm going to do in this talk are two different things. One is to sort of move us in the direction of a particular type of arms race. There are actually lots of them that uh, probably exist in higher education. And then to dive into a couple of budgets, just for a second, because I think they can actually reveal some important points. So how do you know if you're a tuition-driven uh, institution? Uh, in some ways, I mean, of course, all of us. Harvard, even, depends on tuition. So we're all sort of tuition dependent. That's not really what we mean by, uh, by tuition driven. So here's one answer. If between May 1 and August 15th, every important question your president has asked is, have you made your class? then you're a tuition-driven school. That's really, in my opinion, the key question about whether you are in this category of, of college. And that means that at the end of the day, that piece is all about, and this is no different than what Joe was saying before, you know, the key variables, she used the word quality. I'm going to use the use word reputation. Uh, with any luck, those things are linked together in a real way. So I'm not arguing that we need to you know, fake some sort of false branding exercise. Really saying similar sorts of things. And this, this slide, it's all about reputation resources, was literally the first slide that, uh, that I put up there when I, uh, in my first meeting with our board of trustees. Because they need to get off the notion that uh, that we're a profit-maximizing institution. Instead, we really are all about something else. And you know, again, remind yourself that for uh, some of us in this room, this is key. This issue of reputation, reputation is absolutely everything for whether you make your class or not. So here's one model 
of uh, how uh, reputation actually plays out towards, um, uh, towards uh, behavior on a campus and involves Marty Shapiro. Uh, and Marty Sh Shapiro was the president of Williams uh, and is now the president of Northwestern. And I remember vividly being at a conference with Morty, uh, and the session was on assessment. And Morty gave a very, very short and uh, effective presentation on assessment. He was uh, right in the midst of the transition from Williams to, uh, uh, to Northwestern. And he said, look, we accept about 10% of our applicants, and we have all the employers we need knocking down our door to hire our students. We're done with assessment. <laughs> yeah, well, they're done with assessment because Williams already has a reputation that is absolutely solid and, uh, and can attract all the students that they're interesting in, uh, in attracting. That's a world view. That's Morty Shapiro's world view. And I promise you, it hasn't changed since he's been at Northwestern. Did he have to worry about making his class? Well, not a chance. Here's a different model. And here's a model that uh, uh, a variety of schools in this room probably share. But I pick off uh, these four, and I apologize for this. Um, Lawrence should be there, and there it is. Um, this is a, uh, a model for which reputation depends, for example, critically on a book called Colleges That Change Lives. That's a fundamentally different model than the Williams model of reputation uh, building. So I don't know how many of you are aware of this book. I actually survived a long time at Carleton without ever knowing about the, uh, uh, the existence of this book. It was originally produced by Lauren Pope, and he's died, and uh, this has become a bit of a cottage, college, cottage industry. And it's 40 schools that will change the way that you think about college. And I'll just read you just the first piece of this. Um, so the, uh, the preamble here says, getting beyond the hype or why you can relax and enjoy your college search. Uh, let's begin by agreeing, agreeing that college should change your life. It's a catchy idea. So hang on to it for a minute and contemplate. What does it mean to find a college that changes your, your life? The answer depends on you. But for all college-bound teens, the idea of a transformative college experience is an invitation to be bold. Here comes the, he said, don't fall for Ivy worship. Don't listen to the blather about best schools whipped up by the rankings game. Don't let your older friends' descriptions of frat parties and football games define what college should be for you. Be bold. Set your expectations high. And at the end of this, we promote 40 schools, five of which are in the Associated Colleges for the Midwest. And if you don't think this thing matters, in my first two weeks at Beloit College, I went to a prospective student event. So there was, uh, it was a big event. It was in the theater in the uh, on the campus, and there was um, uh, oh, 100, 150 people uh, in the theater, and the director of admissions said, okay, uh, I want to find out how you came to know something about this college. So how many of you first heard about Beloit College through this reputation building device? Half the hands in the room went up. Okay, then how many of you found out from, uh, 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 from an alum? That was about the other half. That's the reputation building that, uh, that uh, currently exists. It's the fundamentally, I promise you, Williams couldn't care less whether they're in this book or not in this book. We care enormously. And just think about what that does to us. So we're. Uh, in some ways, trying to distinguish ourselves and get on the radar screen to a group of students that otherwise wouldn't ever consider uh, this, uh, this set of schools, while at the same time tying us at the hip to 39 other colleges that are near and dear competitors to us. That's the tightrope that we're walking in uh, in this world. And it's, uh, it's an enormously challenging tightrope to both say, this defines us in a really important way, and to then say, but you really need to see how we're different from the other 39 schools in, uh, in this book. And I suspect 
people from the other schools that are up here uh, probably have had similar experiences and similar difficulties trying to navigate this world. But I'm going to argue in just a little bit, this dramatically changes the economics of, uh, of our schools. We are in a very, very competitive world in which nuanced differences in reputation drive everything. So, um, uh, 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 one more time, back to the core thing, what the dilemma of a tuition-driven college. This was an article from trusteeship in a couple years ago. Uh, and of course, the uh, first sentence is in some sense true. The fact, uh, down below, the fact is that virtually all institutions are essentially tuition-driven. But here comes the did you make your class sentence. The game is student recruitment, not admissions that you know, I care about whether our admissions team is making decent choices among our students. I care a lot more whether they're actually recruiting students to the campus. All their energy is around recruitment, and then we spend a few days doing selection. It's, uh, that's where admissions does its, does its work. And the question is to admissions, are you working to make our class? And when we get to May, do we actually have that thing out there? So back to the question, how else would you know if you're tuition driven? Well, here's a new admissions measure. Suppose that instead of just taking the number of people that start an application and then uh, uh, take the percentage that we accept out of the number of people that start an application, we actually looked at what of the applicant pool, what's the fraction that you actually want to have at your school? So you subtract out the applications that were only started and not completed, and you subtract out the, uh, uh, the students that would never, ever cut it academically at any of our institutions, and you subtract out the kids that would burn down a building. Uh, and uh, at the end of that, where are you? And if this number, if you're at an institution where this number gets pretty close to 100%, you're at a tuition-driven school. So, uh, so you can have an acceptance rate of 50% and still be a tuition-driven school at the, uh, at the end of the day. I mean, the number that we put out there is a completely false number for anything that's actually real. What you really care about is how selective are you relative to the set of schools that you actually might be interested in taking at your school. So, um, uh, uh, and just to, again, you know, what does, you know, how big a deal is this enrollment thing? Well, Goddard's not us. Goddard's a lot poorer than, uh, than anybody in this, in this room. But they had to deal with a $550,000 deficit. Why? Where did the deficit come from? Because of enrollment declines. It wasn't because of a decline in endowment. It was because of enrollment declines that caused Goddard to have a $550,000 endowment in which they say, but no layoffs are planned just prior to announcing 75 layoffs. Uh, at, uh, at Goddard, uh, so they weren't, they weren't playing for about 24 hours, uh, and then they happened. Uh, and uh, Ron yesterday mentioned this very recent piece in Inside Higher Ed in which uh, the Department of Justice <laughs> took a set of colleges at the Council of Independent Colleges. So I don't know how many your campuses are part of CIC. I was actually at this meeting of uh, the Council of Independent Colleges, and so I was sort of tangentially connected, oh my god, to, uh, to these conversations uh, around could we do something about one of the arms races, which I'm going to dwell on in a second, the merit award uh, arms races that, uh, that exist. And uh, all these schools, every school that was publicly talking I mean, not doing anything. This was just, isn't it frustrating that we can't collude on um, merit awards? Uh, and uh, the Justice Department is now asked them to keep all of their records, all of their emails, all of their papers, uh, and they're uh, throwing down, uh, down the gauntlet. And uh, I promised to get out of the newspaper business in just a second. But this great piece in the Boston Globe. So you have to understand that leading this effort, leading this effort, queen of the whole thing, was Georgia Nugent at Kenyon College. 
So Georgia's been champion against, uh, uh, you know, is there something we can do about this merit aid race that's, uh, that's going on? And she's a muckety-muck at CIC. Uh, and um, so uh, she ends up, you know, just about a month ago uh, in the Boston Globe uh, saying uh, that um, Georgia Nugent, the outgoing president, she's led discussions among small college presidents about whether they can collectively decrease merit aid without reducing competitive. Yet her own college, disappointed with the crop of students who accepted admissions, enrollment, did you make your class? Boosted merit aid. How embarrassing is this for me, says Georgia, uh, at, the, uh, at the end of this. Yeah, that's the power. And if there's a, a message that's going to come out of this, it's the, it's the strong, strong incentives that we have individually to, um, to actually promote these arms races that we're uh, engaged in. It's just a slightly different take on what, what Jill was saying. Uh, and uh, then um, this last piece simply says that um, the evidence that we get at Beloit College, the evidence that we get is that uh, students at Beloit are very price sensitive around um, uh, decisions that, that they're making. You know, in our world, we are tightly packed with a whole slew of other schools with very, very similar types of reputations and relatively small differences in how we package their financial aid make a big difference in choices that they're making about what schools to attend. And we get a lot of evidence around this. So there's um, insensitivity at some income levels, but for much of the income levels that, uh, that, associate, that come to Bloit College, there's a lot of price sensitivity. You have to be really careful around the packaging. This has more to do with packaging and less to do with sticker price. So, and then finally, just to give you a little bit of context that, uh, uh, that uh, you've heard about before. I just took Beloit College's uh, history here. So this is inflation-adjusted net tuition for the last 10 years. Inflation-adjusted net tuition for the last 10 years. And if you don't see much upward growth in our net tuitions, because there isn't much upward growth in our net tuition, I can't believe that we're the only school in the room that is in a similar position. This is a consequence of extreme price competition, net price competition, among our cohort of schools. I promise you, we didn't go about saying we have a policy directive that says we want net tuition to be flat for a decade. This was a consequence of a market-driven set of decisions that people were, were making. And uh, you know, partly because this was a revelation to me when I arrived on campus, uh, and uh, partly because I wanted our alumni to better understand this. I put this in the magazine. Let me start. Said this was about my second article. Let me start with a poorly understood fact. The cost of a Bloy College education since 2001-2 has risen by $335. Surprised? If you get nothing more out of this magazine than appreciation of the statistic, you have spent your time well. The cost of an education has risen by $335. So why am I dwelling on net price instead of sticker price? Well, the answer is that. 95 to 98 percent of our students receive some merit award or some uh, uh, or need or merit award. That the, the percentage of full pay students, the percentage of students for which that sticker price applies, is tiny. You know, the students that that pay that sticker price are relatively dumb, rich students. That, uh, that pay that price. I mean, if you were a smart student, you'd get the merit award that, uh, uh, that we uh, give to you. And, um, and we like having smart students on the, uh, uh, on the campus. So it's, uh, that sticker price, and, and Jill made this point, that sticker price matters in a different way than that a lot of students are actually paying that, uh, that thing. We actually have some institutional stickiness that gets at, uh, gets at this. When you said that the cost had only risen by 335, you didn't mean that what it cost to educate students. No, it was really, so I was, I was being loose with the numbers. 
to Jill's point, so I apologize for that. It was the net price. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. So let me just, uh, uh, since Ron Ehrenberg you know, said all these things yesterday, I think uh, 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 there's a part of this that he's absolutely right about. But one of the things that we can do as leaders in education is to at least try to combat some of these things. So, uh, so you know, Dr. Ehrenberg says, you know, you're, we all are perceived to be part of the problem, and we are. That's true. I mean, you can't deny that. We hear it all the time in, in conversations. That's absolutely accurate. But he says, well, because we're increasing student tuition, well, as I just said, if you look at, all you look at is sticker price, this is true, but at Beloit, since 95 to 98 percent of our students get some sort of grant award, I don't know, you know, it's the wrong thing to be looking at. So it's, uh, it's they picked the wrong statistic it, given what they're trying to say. Uh, and he says, well, you have to worry about the perception of increasing student loans. Well, you have to worry about the perception. But the reality is, for most of our schools, that if you adjust for uh, in inflation, our loan burden for our students have been pretty well flat over, uh, over this uh, period. It's really not a serious issue. I mean, if it's an issue now, it should have been an issue 10 years ago, because it hasn't really changed. Over, over that time. And he said, only a small number of students with modest means come to your college. Well, I'm not quite sure what small means in this context, uh, but it was a lot more than it was 10 years ago. So we're well over 20% in Pell eligible students at Beloit. And you go back 10 years, and we were 10 to 12% uh, Pell uh, eligible students. And this year's class, we have 26% domestic minority in, uh, in this year's class. And furthermore, I bet this is true at every one of the institutions here, that the average income uh, family income for people that come to Beloit College is far less than the average family income of kids that go to UW-Madison. And pick your flagship schools. I bet that that's true at uh, nearly everybody here. So yeah, I don't know that this is relevant. Uh, and then, well, we don't spend enough out of our endowment. Well, maybe that's true at Grinnell. Uh, but I wish we didn't spend uh, uh, so much out of our, uh, uh, out of our endowment. We're, uh, you know, depending on what special draw we've got, we're between 6 and 7% out, uh, uh, out of our endowment. So we have a, you know, a statutory uh, uh, amount of 4.5%. But there's special draws that happen. There are fees that happen. So all in, it's a higher number than anything that we'd be enormously comfortable with. With. And uh, in dollar terms, you still widen the gap with public institutions. And Jill made this point. No, no. I mean, that, that's that's true for people with incomes over two hundred thousand dollars. Everywhere else, that gap is in dollar terms getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's it's reversed in uh, in most cases at Beloit. A good student. And this, Clearly was true at Colorado as well. A good student, uh, for a good student, we're now cheaper than UW for incomes up to uh, 200,000. Uh, and so I'm just confirming what, uh, what was true at Colorado College. OK, so that's my whining about, uh, uh, about the differences between reality and perception that, uh, that exist out there. But these differences are enormous and about every substantive issue. And the national conversation is frankly just wrong with respect to the institutions that are in this room. And it'd be helpful if our voices were louder uh, about this. Uh, and you, know, you do what you can do. And you know, my pieces that I've written for the New York Times have been rejected. Uh, but uh, you know we will continue to fight the uh, to fight the good fight. Um, but back to the point, the key thing about this thing that we maximize, which is quality or reputation, is that it's inherently relative. And things that are inherently relative to each other when you're in competition lends itself towards non-cooperative behavior, uh, and uh, that means that it lends itself to arms races. So, back to Dr. Strangelove, and suppose you just so don't get caught up in the specifics of the numbers. I just wanted to generate a stylized example of something that makes a much, much larger point. So let me get through the stylized example. And if you want to quibble about the numbers, we can quibble about the numbers in a little bit. But this is uh, my argument would be that this applies to a 
actually a vast range of possible values that we could uh, put into this. It's a metaphor for a much larger array. So suppose that you're at an institution where a rich student without merit, uh, without a merit award, pays tuition of $40,000. Uh, and a rich student, sorry, I left out award. And, and, uh, In case you wonder whether I did my own PowerPoints, turns out I did. Uh, and a rich student with a merit award pays $30,000, so a $10,000 merit award uh, uh, per year that comes into this. An average student, that's going to come into play, uh, because if you don't get your rich student, you're going to get an average student, uh, 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 pays $25,000. So there's a financial aid, a need-based financial aid award that's on average. So on average, uh, there's a very small number of students that don't have some needs, so uh, this, is, this would be true. And a good student is uh, more valuable to us than a mediocre student. This exactly was Jill's point, that we're in the pr business of trying to put good students with good students. Uh, and so all I've done is to put a dollar value on, uh, on what it means to have a premium for a good student. So as an institution, we like the education that that good student provides for other students. We like the fact that a good student may go out and make more money uh, after, they, uh, after they leave or lead a more productive life after they leave. And that gives back to the institution, either financially or through reputation. Uh, and so the combination of those things, I just put a number on and called it $12,000 because it's convenient. OK, now suppose that we have two schools embedded in a non-cooperative engagement here. Uh, and we're not allowed to talk to each other because the Justice Department is going to do exactly what they're doing right now if we, uh, if we talk to each other about things. So if I offer a merit award and you do not, we're, we're close enough substitutes. So the probability of the student choosing me is going to be 1.0. It's, it's certainty. They will choose me. Uh, and if you offer a merit award and I don't, they're going to choose you. So it's, it's determinative. And that just makes the calculations easier. And if both of us offer the same merit award, the probability of the uh, a rich student, the rich good student, is 0.5. So if we match each other, it's kind of a coin toss as to where the student ends up. And if we match each other with no merit award, there's still a coin toss uh, about where the student ends up. And that allows me just to do a simple little calculation. Uh, so all that's changed is this bottom part. So if I offer a merit award and then you don't, the expected payoff to me is I give a merit award, so I get net tuition of $30,000. And then uh, I value that student at $12,000. So I am sort of to the good by $42,000. And if you offer a merit award and I don't, then I don't get the good student. I just get the average student who pays me $25,000. And that average student is not meritorious. So uh, that student doesn't get a merit award. And if both of us offer a merit award, there's a 50% chance that I get the good student and a 50% chance I get the less good student, which totals this 33.5. And same thing, if both of us offer no merit award, then the expected payoff is 50% um, that I get the good student, but I'm not given a merit award in this case. So I get $40,000 of net tuition plus $12,000 of the good student for a total of $52,000 plus there's a 50% chance I get the, the lower income, weaker student for a total of 38.5. And I can summarize all of this really neatly. So suppose I face a choice. I mean, I do. I can either offer a merit award to the student, or I can choose not to offer a merit award to the student. And my competitor in this, you, you can choose to offer a merit award, or you can choose not to offer a merit award. And I'm just going to sit there and calculate my benefits from different outcomes. And all I did is translate, done is translate what was on the previous slide right to here. So suppose I engage in the following mental experiment. Suppose I say, OK, one thing you might do is offer a merit award. If you choose to offer a merit award, so I'm up here, 
then I can choose to offer one as well, in which case I can expect to make 33.5, or I can choose to not offer a merit award, in which case I make 25. So if I really believe that you were going to offer a merit award, what's the best thing for me to do? Offer a merit award, right? 33.5 is better than 25. Now let's do another experiment. Suppose I believed that you are not going to offer a merit award. So if I believe that you're not going to offer a merit award, I can choose to offer a merit award, which is I get 42. Or I can choose to not offer a merit award, just like you, and get 38.5. So if you're not going to offer a merit award, what am I going to choose to do? I'm still going to offer a merit award, no matter what you choose to do. My incentive is to offer a merit award. Now, my incentive is to offer a merit award, but if we're symmetrical, so we're very similar schools, so your payoffs are likely not going to be very different from mine, your incentive is going to be to offer a merit award. We both offer merit awards. We both end up here. And if the Justice Department would just get off our backs, <laughs> we could both talk to each other and say, why in the world are we giving this student whose family income is well over $200,000 a merit award of $10,000 a year to come to our schools when at the end of the day, we're basically just splitting up the same students that we started with in the first place. We're paying a fortune to end up where we began. And that fortune is reflected, in this case, by the difference between what happens if we both offer merit awards versus what would happen if we could both figure out a mechanism to not offer merit awards and end up in this place. I mean, this is, as in fact, most of you know, this is just the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, but it's the dilemma that most of us are in. Certainly, every tuition-driven school is in, in spades. And this is, this is our world, and it exists for merit awards, it exists for facility spaces, and the list goes on and on and on about the quality enhancements that Jill is talking about that uh, all have expense components to it that uh, drive our decisions towards uh, more expensive outcomes. Now, in a lot of those decisions, there's actually quality differences that are real, that are associated with it. You know, students that live in better dorms get better dorms. <laughs> you know, in this instance, you know, from the perspective of the quality of, edu of the education, nobody benefits from this, frankly, very expensive world that we're in. Tom? How, how is this different from a car dealer, which was the other metaphor that was used? Um, it's a competitive business. They offer discounts to, to sell cars. I don't think it is any different. But, but, okay. But yeah, so I think that uh, you know, car dealerships, I think there's a lot of evidence that they make essentially zero profits. Uh, out of the, they're driven down to, uh, uh, to the point of price equaling cost. Uh, and I think that's very, very similar. So what's the argument against the antitrust framework generally? I mean, baseball players, can all end up on teams, and yet they can take in larger and larger salaries, and business owners hate that, right? Yeah. So the interesting thing is that we have a lot of evidence about how this played out before the antitrust case was brought against the Ivy League uh, uh, on this. And the evidence was that schools were using this to, frankly, keep down merit awards uh, in ways that allowed them to keep their costs down, that, uh, that in fact, there's at least uh, you know, decades worth of evidence prior to the Justice Department action that, uh, that said that that was the way schools behave. I mean, MIT fought the, uh, the Justice Department on this and on the grounds that this freed up resources for MIT to devote more resources to need-based financial aid, and it did. That's how they used it. And, uh, and 
Uh, so, and, I mean, the good news is, you know, the you know, if, we, if the Justice Department would ever entertain an argument, there's an empirically based um, case that can be made based on pre-1980 or whenever it was that the, uh, uh, that the case was brought that is uh, supportive of a case that this just doesn't lead to just higher costs for institutions. Sarah? So can you do a tit for tat implicit collusion that is yeah. legal? Yeah, so I mean that's a great, great question. And I have no idea. Uh, so I don't know that. I mean I um, yeah, so Sarah, I, I mean I, I <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, this is the question, right? Is how do you actually, and, you know, uh, Ron gave a great talk, but he completely punted. I don't know what question he thought he heard, uh, but, um, but it wasn't the coordination question. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I've thought a little bit about it. I haven't gotten a solution, and I really don't want my emails rifled through by the Department of Justice, so I've been a little bit careful about, uh, uh, about doing this. But I think but it's a real. But I worried about the, the heterogeneity within the smaller yeah. group, so that the the game isn't symmetric. And so I'm not sure about the dominant strategies. I'm exactly. sorry. Exactly. So are there little mini uh, mini consortia that can for can be generated around this that actually allows us through? And I don't know enough about ACM's history, but there was a time at which students could actually apply to the ACM. Uh, and literally you were then accepted by all the ACM schools and I think that there was a, effectively a collusion. So you you uh, indicated which, uh, the top three schools. That's where so it was. You go to the first school, if you're not accepted there, you be sent to the second. Okay, so you yeah, rank ordering of schools. But there was a, I mean, the ACM has its own history of a type of collusion around, uh, around this question. I actually think that's an important area to explore, and I just haven't done it, Sarah, in ways that are probably worthy of the, uh, of the quality. Isn't another problem, though, for some schools that are in this very dilemma, that the collusion with the school wouldn't be enough, and they'd have to have other schools who would choose a public Possibly, I mean, but it still would get, I mean, I still think it would mitigate uh, the issue, if not eliminate the, the problem. Yes? I don't want to elicit a collective groan from all the economists in the room, but <clears throat> besides figuring out the mechanisms for coordination, uh, if you could even figure that out, different size schools, different preference orderings, as soon as you begin that enterprise, you are sending an engraved invitation to the government to regulate that coordination. Uh, right. And that's a very, very testy area that, it, that I'm not sure, and we can talk about this maybe tomorrow when we talk about governance. Um, it's, it's totally uncharted waters. It is. I actually, you know, that's a great point. I'm glad you raised that because it goes, uh, I do think this question goes immediately, well, if we can't solve this coordination problem, maybe the government can solve this uh, coordination because there's no shortage of prisoner's dilemmas issues in which the government has stepped in with an attempt to try to solve it. Whether it ends up being worse than it was before is, a, uh, is an open question. But you know, it's a very interesting question to say, should the government take over financial aid policy? And, uh, and what would be the impact of that? And could that control this in a way that still keeps us private in ways that we are comfortable being private. That's an enormously fraught conversation, but not one that I think is immediately dismissed. Uh, so I think it's still an interesting question. Well, is the heart of it that the creation of a trust or even collusion will benefit middle and low income students? Exactly. Yep. So, you know, right now, all of our school, I suspect all of our uh, I don't know where Grinnell is on, whether they actually implant. I think Grinnell is on a holding pattern. Uh, I think the rest of us are all need sensitive. Uh, and very, uh, Bloyd is certainly need sensitive. Uh, and um, so uh, whether, you know, something like this actually provides us as a pathway towards less sensitivity around admissions with respect to ability to pay uh, is an interesting question. Whether there's a commitment that we could make around those lines that uh, made it credible that we could do that is a really important question. Um, 
I have a son at USC, which of course is one of the richest of the rich. But it's interesting what they've done is they say when you arrive as a freshman, nobody gets merit aid because they say you're all meritorious and you might earn it in subsequent years. Yeah. And I don't know, I mean, I, it's, it's a really interesting idea and I don't know if we've ever thought about it. So that. great point. So USC can do that. Right. What, uh, and we do that, I'm going to get 200 letters from parents who have been admitted to, whose child have been admitted to Beloit College saying, Augustana, Knox, Lawrence, Grinnell, McAllister have all given my child this merit award. I cannot do this alone. So it has to be a collective effort. There's a really interesting statistic that I didn't highlight back there, but there's a statistic that says, you know, that Georgia Nugent put together, said, you know, when she went out and polled presidents, 65% of the CIC presidents that she, po that she polled would be willing to give up merit awards. That's not close to enough. That's not close to enough, because as soon as this thing cracks, it cracks all the way down. So this is enormously sensitive to, uh, 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 to a um, domino effect of a set of schools engaging in merit awards that impacts another set of schools, impacts another set of schools. I mean, there's a complication around this. But uh, she's, uh, you know, if it's 68%, she's still 30% off at least about what she needs to get in order for this to actually be pieced together. Gets back to the government argument, right? That, uh, or, or is there a mini consortia that actually are tight that you can uh, try to drive some of this around? And the competitive world you live in is so critical. So for example, most, none of the Ivy League give merit awards. And so the competition that USC is in, that world does not give merit. And the same thing is true of all, most of the North Northeastern liberal arts colleges, none of them give um, merit awards. So if you're competing in those groups, then you're then you're you don't have to. But when you get in, as soon as you're in the, a different group that does it, then you have to do it, right? Or you're not going to make your class. Exactly. So um, the Annapolis group, another group of colleges, met at the beginning of this week, and one of the speakers there was David Warren, who is uh, who leads NICU, the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities. A lot of the CIC colleges are in it, and the Annapolis group of colleges. He was one of the people named in this article and got the letter to about saying your emails. We want to know about the, the pollution that we suspect. And he said, so if the executive branch is going to come down on us, we believe in divided government. We're going to Congress. And he said, our strategy is we're going to go to Congress and ask Congress to create an exception and I trust legislation so that we can do this. So basically, their strategy, I don't know if it's going to work or not, is to do precisely what Frank has yeah. asked about. Um, one of the factors, first of all, I, I have to say that it's interesting to think about merit aid and, and the way it's risen and used in this way at a time when the national statistics are about students coming to college who can do college level math is lower than it's ever been before. Right. So, so one of the elephants in the room in all this is what are we really talking about when we say merit aid? I mean, it goes back to the USC thing. We don't know what merit is in college until we see students in college doing college level work. So that's one thing I want to say. But, but, but the question I want to ask is, isn't, isn't one of the issues here the psychological, uh, just the, the, the very difficult to quantify factor of institutions saying to students, you're special, we want you, you're a better, you're a better incoming student than the person who lives next door to you who could have really the same kind of preparation and profile. So, so that part of, if, if, if we were to get out of the merit business, yeah. how would colleges try to create within students a sense that this is the best place for you, and we really want you. Right. So um, there, uh, at least in my experience, uh, there is, there are a large number of at least the stuff that comes to me almost always comes from parents. Uh, number of parents who. Uh, are looking for my kids worthy of a merit award. Uh, and um, we've, 
we've tried in limited ways to experiment with, OK, so how sensitive are you to the size of the mirror? If all you want is this badge that says, we found you worthy to the tune of some dollars, then can we get away with $1,000 uh, and not a larger amount? And there, I don't know the answer. My personal guess is, uh, in, um, is that our ability to get away with that depends critically on our relative reputation compared to the other schools that we're up against in that. So when I talk about improving the college's reputation, connected with that is how do I enhance net tuition? Because with every step that I improve the college's reputation, we are going to try to reduce merit awards. So we will translate that into changed behavior on our part to try to supplement the operating budget, financial aid, need-based financial aid budget. And there's uh, core aspects, really core aspects of what we're trying to, to achieve through this mechanism. So you know, our exp your question's a really good one. And I don't really know the answer, nor have I seen any empirics around the, uh, uh, the question. Do you know of any, Jeff? Well, I mean, the answer is that, so we don't give merit aid except for Division I athletics at, at CC, but that's because our competitor schools don't give merit aid, right? And so if you're, we, we've seen the empirics yeah. is that if you are competing in a certain group, <laughs> so once it started, right, it, in a group, then it's hard to go back and get rid of it, right? And so the, the Northeastern Liberal Arts Colleges, which are, well, most of our cross um, admits are in, right, are, have all said they're not going down the merit aid area, right? They don't give merit aid. And so and we all know if one of them started, you know what would happen? They'd all have to start giving it, and then they'd end up in the wrong corner of, of Scott's box. So somehow reversing it is hard, but um, <laughs> You can't do it without coordination, right, in, in a lot of ways. And I do think the issue I brought up earlier about the public yep. is a little bit of a sticky wicket for that group of, of schools, for some of those schools, where you might say, um, now I'll go to UW, right, if, if you can't, if the price is so much different. So, uh, but, that, but the empirical evidence is, I mean, the, the 568 group can coordinate. That's people who are need blind and meet need. I think there are 28 institutions in the entire country that both are need blind and meet need, meaning that meet need means you meet the need of the student according to the FAFSA, right, with, with either grant or loan. And that number is shrinking right now. Wesleyan's come off it. When I was at Wake Forest, we went off of it um, as well because we couldn't afford it anymore. But they can, they can collude and collaborate according to the Department of Justice. So they can continue to say, we're not going to go down merit aid awards and agree on that. Yeah. yeah, so let me just give you a sense. And, and so I'm going to. Uh, uh, spare you the Excel uh, spreadsheet here. So let me try to do a quick and dirty summary of what I also was going to show you, because this is importantly connected to, uh, to this. So let me do a little case, uh, mental case study. So I've got Beloit College on one hand, and then um, a school that is near and dear to my heart, um, uh, where I happen to do my undergraduate work, um, uh, on the other hand. Uh, so here's a relevant statistic for you. Uh, so Beloit, US News and World Report, let me get away with that, you know, somewhere around 60. Uh, the other school, somewhere around 20 in US News and World Report. So a reputational difference between these two schools. Uh, Beloit's Endowment is about $120 million. This other school's endowment is about $220 million. So a little bit less than double uh, Beloit's, uh, Beloit's endowment. The other school, we charge tuition, tuition of about $35,000. Uh, and so the remainder, $9,000 or so, $10,000 is room and board uh, stuff. We charge about $35,000, which we then, uh, of course, discount for which, as far as I can tell, about $5 million of that discount is merit awards. Uh, 
that's, uh, that are out there. It's, it's hard to tell because we trade off need for merit and we don't account for it as clearly as I, uh, as I might like. But that's a pretty educated guess as to how much we spend on, on merit awards. The other school charges about $45,000 in tuition and claims, anyhow, no merit awards. Okay. Now, the difference, in, if I take that other school, adjust it downward in size so that we have the same number of students and so I adjust the endowment uh, appropriately, adjust financial aid appropriately, you know, do all the calculations, presume I did it right, that sort of make the demographics of the two schools the same. We end up with an operating budget, a net tuition operating budget. So this is after accounting for financial aid awards. We end up with a net uh, operating budget of about $40 million. This other school ends up with a net operating budget of about $60 million, of which 80% of that difference comes from net tuition. 80% of that, the reputational difference between being 60 and being 20 is $16 million in annual operating budget. You know, we have about 300, about 100 faculty and 300 staff. We, um, on average, pay our faculty about 70,000. On average, pay our staff about half of that, about 35,000. This school, on average, pays its faculty about 105,000. On average, pays its staff about half of that. And this allows them to do that and hire another 160 staff which is about how they spend the money, which provides quality. It does. It provides quality that, uh, that is perceived by, I mean, that's a big, big deal. So it's not that, uh, that endowments don't have a secondary effect through the enhancement of a college's education, but you don't want to lose sight on the reputational effects on the operating budget. So our emphasis on reputation and resources is this really critical connection between those, those two things. Our ability to most rapidly get to greater resources to enhance the college's quality, its reputation, is through first starting with reputation and driving that towards resources that then puts you into a really critical cycle. And that, if we uh, can measure what we produce, a lot of those people would pay off, would be willing to say, I'll pay, I'll, let's get rid of the merit aid and I'll take the greater quality, right? But because they can't measure, we can't measure it, we can't make that argument. Right? So anyhow, um, you know, if I uh, just bounce down and then I'll be done in just one second, Chris. And so, um, so what options do we have? And you know, let me just so, sort of do a, a little bit of a higher education thing. You know, the Mellon Foundation, I, mean, I don't know how many of you have heard Gene Tobin, who's the program officer at Mellon, give one of his several hundred speeches on I only have one word for you. Uh, that's the title of it. And the word is collaboration. Uh, and uh, then we heard Dr. Ehrenberg say the same thing. We're talking about sharing services and, uh, and sharing courses. You know, in my experience, collaboration is really hard uh, and really staff intensive. And uh, it's not that I don't think there are some opportunities. This is not going to be the game changer. For, uh, for our sector or for higher education. It may cut at the margins in some places, but that's going to be uh, about, and just as Jill said, maybe there'll be some savings with uh, technology, but she said this in her talk, and I agree completely, it's just going to lend itself to an arms race uh, with at least as much likelihood as saving any money. And if all it does is lead to another prisoner's dilemma, then it's just going to end up costing us more than, uh, than we have. So, I mean, I think that 
uh, we have a tough time here. You know, we promisely, we promise, it's in all our admissions, we promise uh, heavily mentored in individual education. That makes it hard to cut back on people. We promise that we believe in the principle of access and importance of having a diverse community. We really do. But that makes it hard to cut back on financial aid and uh, this need-based financial aid. We promise we believe in the residential learning experience. That makes it hard to cut back on the physical plant. And even when you're cutting back, you're cutting at your reputation, just as you've heard earlier. So those things are really, really tough. And at Beloit College, for a tuition-driven school, there's almost nothing in the budget, almost nothing that's not people, financial aid, or building. You don't have anywhere else to go to after, uh, after you've got those three things that are out there. That's the challenge that, that we're in. I don't have a solution to it. Maybe this group uh, in uh, the rest of your time today and tomorrow can figure this out. Uh, but you know, it's what keeps me up at night on a, uh, uh, on a regular basis. It makes the job uh, interesting. So thank you for your patience and your uh, attention.